So, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much to all of you for being here, and obviously, thanks to Teresa for inviting me. And not only for, invit for inviting me and to curating the whole thing, but for asking us to think in contemporary terms, which I think that is something to be grateful for. It's the second time in my life that I'm giving thanks to, <laughs> because of that, this reason, uh, and the first one was uh, two months ago with uh, Rossi Braidotti, so <laughs> I think that we are in the right place. So, uh, well, um, as Sasha said, um, I come from a kind of philosophy field. I'm a doctor in philosophy. If is, I mean, maybe <laughs> there's no meaning. <laughs> but the thing is that I'm sorry, but uh, I'm going to talk about subjectivity, yes, again. <laughs> And you know that uh, philosophers uh, tend to um, disrupt and annoying, or can be quite annoying with the ethical thing. So <laughs> we are going to through. Uh, well, we are going to, to to pass through some ethical questions. So during the last five years, more or less, I've been developing research on the relationship between contemporary biology and artistic practices mainly focused on biotech, those practices that sometimes we can uh, define as bioart, bio art, sorry. And in fact, the, thes the thesis of my doctoral dissertation was and is uh, that some bioart projects uh, has the potential to disorganize the body and to disorganize the life concept taxonomies and the persistence of some hegemonic um, narratives, or at least uh, has the potential to generate interruptions in the persistence of some hegemonic narratives. So um, when Teresa invited me to this conference, um, she asked me to prepare a kind of uh, something about my philosophical ideas on bioart, <laughs> with a focus on the new materiality, uh, the changes and consequences that um, working with biomaterials um, may mean for art and our society. And I thought, OK, sounds pretty interesting, but I'm not an expert on materialism. <laughs> but during the last month, that's true that I've been working uh, on new materialisms from a post-human perspective, mainly related to Rossi Braidotti. And uh, I would like to highlight uh, when I'm referring to post-human theory or post-human condition, or post-human perspective uh, is uh, kind of understood as a navigational tool, okay? A kind of cartography, contemporary cartography, uh, a kind of a way to arise some questions and concerns, but never as an ontology or even meta-ontology, okay? Just to to put the things in in their place. So my proposal here is quite simple is to share some questions, as you pretty know, I mean, you know pretty well, uh, contemporary philosophy is more uh, generating questions than giving answers. So <laughs> that's my role here today. So uh, while my proposal is to share some questions, putting together projects that work with biomaterials, and sometimes we can define uh, as a bio art or sometimes not, but uh, I mean, some questions that emerged when I was working, I, I was writing, sorry, my doctoral dissertation, and uh, continue completely unresolved. That's a, a, a good thing for me as a philosopher. <laughs> so basically, the aim is, uh, of this, interve this intervention is to think in common about the possibilities of connecting with the others, uh, from a post-human condition perspective, but specifically related to post-anthropocentrism, okay? So, uh, one of the fir first questions uh, that we can address, taking into account the context in we are, which um, we are today, is that biomaterials let 
us to rethink traditional dualisms, quite obvious, by the way. Mm -hmm. But artworks or artistic projects or artistic processes give us the chance to rethink, giving to rethink this kind of dualisms, uh, giving a special attention to matter. I mean, giving a special attention to the process of materialization. Mm -hmm. But why I'm going to talk about these biomaterials as something related to new materialism? What are the implications of this kind of new? Mm -hmm. First of all, let me say, and this is quite important for me, <laughs> Uh, that new doesn't mean a kind of better or, or improved version of old materialism. It's a materialism that comes from uh, Spinoza and Deleuze, contributions to the philosophy of the body, mainly. Okay? So if you are interested in these new materialisms, um, I truly recommend it, that book, uh, mainly you already, you already know. So uh, when we ask, um, why is this new materialism related to biomaterials? In this book, they took the contributions of uh, Delanda and Braidotti, two philosophers, as you know, in order to think on the transvers transversality of the new materialism. And there's one thing that I consider relevant to our discussion today, referring to the Landa's early version of uh, new materialism. So uh, taking the notion of abstract machine, uh, you can see here my completely lack of a talent to do artistic things. So <laughs> these are obviously a kind of uh, rhizomatic uh, root uh, <laughs> feeding new materialisms, uh, you know, from the land and Rossi Braidotti. Always the less is, obviously, is always here. So taking the notion of uh, the abstract machine developed by Deleuze and Guattari in a thousand plateaus, um, and keeping in mind that abstract machines act in a specific ag agentment, okay, this is a kind of a comp difficult word to pronounce, uh, this conception of abstract machine captures processes without form of substance that can be found in concrete assemblages of biology, sociology, and let me add f philosophy, of course, <laughs> in a manner that enables cultural theory a large to move away from linguistic representationalism towards the realm of engineering diagrams which are ch shared by different physical assemblages. So, the main reason, um, let me say that this is a, do you know this project? No? Uh, this is a project that uh, Mark uh, Ginn uh, is developing in, he's trying to illustrate a thousand plateaus and well, he's doing this, uh, these illustrations, and of course, I'm I'm completely in love. I know that it's quite freak, but you know. <laughs> uh, so, the main reason to put biomaterials in the center of uh, this kind of new materialisms is precisely that uh, biomaterials uh, engenders or helps to gender immanent thought. Biomaterials are generative matter in terms of the lambda, that is, matering as simultaneously material and representation, okay? And also, the immanence offers new forms of subjectivity from a materialism that is understood as equally, equally immanent, non-linear, and embodied and embedded subjectivity. And of course, I'm referring, of course, to Rossi Braidotti, okay? So, uh, one of the most interesting apportations of biomaterials is, I think, the possibility of connecting with the others, those non-human others, uh, not only from the interaction, but from intraaction, okay? Or in terms of Braidotti, 
taking into account this kind of continuum uh, nature culture. Okay, so let me, yeah, you know, it's a typical presentation from a philosopher full of text and without images, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. So, uh, there's something uh, connected to Maya presentation with this uh, uh, focus and stress and this kind of in-between, no? becoming animal, this kind of solidarity between interspecies. <laughs> Uh, so, so I would like to put the other one to read. Okay. So, in this quote from Braidotti, I would like that you put your attention in this kind of otherness, uh, understood as pejorative difference or as being worth less than. Uh, because we'll be back in a minute. Uh, as Teresa remarks, uh, the idea of otherness is central in contemporary, in contemporary studies, but the thing is who or what conform this otherness. Hmm? If we place ourselves in the kind of continuum uh, natural culture proposed by Braidotti as a starting point on the, of the post-human theory, uh, we are placing ourselves in the interaction between technolo technological and the natural, between human and non-human. Mm? Taking the interaction proposal from, of course, Karen Barat, as the mutual conditions of the entangled agencies, understanding agency here, and this is important to simply quite simply, I know, as the ability to act, uh, we must emphasize the difference between interaction and intra-action. But I think that it's uh, extremely important if we want to think about connecting the others. So, in a briefly and very simple way, uh, inter refers to in the midst of, and intra refers to, with, to within. So when two bodies interact, they each maintain a level of independence. Each entity exists before they account to one another. However, when bodies interact, they do it in a constitutive way, materialized through interactions, and the ability to act emerges from with it the relationship, not outside of it. And I think that it's important. So interaction gives us a possibility of thinking about the relationship with the others or each other, with materials, non-human, discourses, etc., with human and non-human actors, uh, a kind of phenomenological approach. Mm -hmm. So what is important here in that interaction What is important here, I mean, is that uh, when we talk about interaction, interaction deflects responsibility. But interaction, um, in interactions, uh, responsibility is distributed among the constitutive entities. Okay, so if you were asking for the agency, this is when agency appears in the play. Hmm? Agency is about action, reconfiguring, doing, and being. And the most important thing or point, agency doesn't pre-exist separately, OK? But emerges from the relationship in interactions. So from that point, we can understand ethics as not predetermined, uh, but always changing and unfolding a kind of a continuing I don't know if hybrid or hybridization. <laughs> uh, so interactions, I think, that helps to think in terms of simultaneously and reveal the and artificial boundaries that we forgot we invented. And I think that it's important, too. So as a result, when we think on the possibility of a kind of uh, post-anthropocentric shift in the, in the context of uh, post-human condition, 
Uh, working on the possibility of a sort kind of uh, nomadic subjectivities, the risky part is not uh, the tragical delusion of the human defended f uh, by, for example, Fukuyama. Hmm? Uh, as Braidioti remarks, uh, I think in a very, very smart <laughs> uh, way, the most serious political problems in post-anthropocentric theory arise from the instrumental alliance of biogenetic capitalism with individualism as a residual humanist definition of the subject. If we are talking about subjectivities, we need to focus in this point. So working with biomaterials, taking into account biopolitical and bioethical questions, taking into, into account, I repeat, biopolitical, not only working with biomaterials, but taking into account these two questions, biopolitical and bioethical questions, we have the chance to open new forms of subjectivity, not only related to humans, as you were um, kind of uh, working on before. So when posthuman theory proposed a post-anthropocentric shift based in relational ethics, or sometimes a name as hybrid ethics, what is really being proposed is the deconstruction of the human supremacy, the conception of anthropos, and this kind of conception that uh, try to mark a, a clear uh, difference between uh, anthropos, vios, and thoe, okay? So in contrast to Fukuyama, we don't like Fukuyama, okay. No, I, I'm kidding. <laughs> but in contrast to this kind of uh, tragical uh, Fukuyama and this kind of um, technophilia, uh, <laughs> the post-anthropocentric nomadic subjectivity don't propose um, uh, don't propose an otherness based in being worth less than but propose what I've called a kind of uh, being with the others in the estrangement, and this being with the other in the estrangement is written with hyphens. You know that for philosophers, it's not the same to write with or without hyphens. You know, it's a yeah, <laughs> you know, it's a kind of interconnecting or intra. We'll see, but yeah, is the inheritance of uh, such a lovely and cute person named Mart Martin Heidegger. Hmm? <laughs> Taking, okay, so taking the proposal of uh, being with the others based in a trans, trans, trans species uh, solidarity, I think. Uh, and as Braidotti suggests, creating a new social nexus, I think that uh, the works developed by Maya are in some kind in this line, uh, to creating a new social nexus and new forms of social connection with these techno-others, not only human or non-human animals. So what we are dealing here with, if I understood the whole thing, that I'm not really sure if I've understood the whole thing, is uh, with the possibility of understanding ourselves as a kind of transversal entity which includes those others, fully immersed and immanent to a network of non-human relations, moving from an unitarian subjectivity to a nomadic subjectivity. This implies the removal of the privileges bestowed upon our supremacy, <laughs> demanding to the subject a kind of estrangement. A, hum a human subject, of course. So some artistic projects working with biomaterials, uh, biotechnology and technologies in general terms uh, have the potential sometimes, not always, to give to these techniques and related issues a social dimension, dimension that was something that yesterday came up to the necessity of giving us social dimension. So projects on augmented uh, abilities, such as Stellar's work, and I know, yeah, pretty old stuff, uh, works on prosthetics or the possibility of making your own replaces, 3D printing, uh, injury um, tissues or organs, or 
works on encountering others, such this kind of uh, project, the machine to be another. You know that um, now in Barcelona we have the plus human or human plus. It depends on your position on the issue. We have the, this exhibition running until April, I think. And this project uh, is in the exhibition. Uh, you know pretty well because uh, your project is or uh, is still in 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 the exhibition. So, this kind of of projects, uh, for example, the machine to be another, uh, or projects works on authoring environments. For instance, the Center for Postnatural History. That I know that probably you know pretty well. A kind of collection preserved and document documented organisms that have been intentionally modified in utilitarian terms. Uh, or the incredible shrinking man, this is one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, a kind of a speculative research, uh, let me say, with a brilliant sense of humor. <laughs> uh, a speculative uh, research on about or on the implications of downsizing uh, human species to better fit the earth, or some of the which are plays in a section named as Life in the Ages, such as the semi-living worry dolls that you know pretty well too, a kind of old stuff. The semi-living worry dolls developed by Tissue Culture and Art, uh, this project by Symbiotica, that you know they are pretty dead. <laughs> So, yeah, when I was visiting the exhibition, I was thinking, okay, it's true that uh, maybe we cannot only define as bioart, uh, or we cannot only apply this kind of uh, bioart definition to those artistic projects that are working with, um, I don't want to say living matter, but um, I don't know, living entities. <laughs> um, but it's something related to presenting or representing that is a kind of uh, messy or tricky from my perspective. Because when I went to the exhibition to see the semi-living worry dolls and I was like, okay, they are completely poor, they are pretty dead, in fact. So, uh, you know, the the... The, one of the most interesting things uh, I, I think of this project is that it, it was about a kind of interaction with uh, a kind of entities, the semi-living worry dolls, a kind of entities that weren't defined as a specific being. And when I went to the exhibition, I have an aesthetic experience, not of this kind of interaction, but of the remains of semi-living worry dolls. So we are converting a kind of dynamic project in a, in a sort of aesthetic object. Okay, just to, just to put it in maybe to, to discuss. So nevertheless of this project, so they were living, now they are dead. <laughs> you know, this kind of dualisms. So, okay. Okay, uh, I wanted to go back to Stella very briefly, but maybe it's not necessary. But let me uh, say that you know pretty well the Stellar's works, uh, performances like uh, Pink Body or Parasite, and working on this kind of involuntary movement of the body. And on this involuntary movement of the body, Stellar sets out a question that uh, I mean, as a philosopher, uh, I consider pretty interesting. And he asked, uh, it wasn't Wittgenstein who asked what would remain if when you raise your arm, the attention to raise it was eliminated? Or can a body cope with experiences of extreme absence and strange action without becoming overcome by outmoded metaphysical fears and obsessions about individuality and free agency? Again. So, 
Uh, I mean, this kind of questions, which is the puppet and which is the manipulator? Hmm? We, who is the master and who is the slave? Hmm? So I would suggest that some still are statements such as uh, we have always been prosthetic bodies or a kind of contemporary version not from Stella, we have always been biohackers, illustrate in some way the, this kind of cultural natural continuum. So I'm running out of time, you know. We can skip the extent. Yeah, I love this joke from Hacteria, the eye on arm. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> quite, quite, yeah. <laughs> so, well, uh, just very briefly, the extended body uh, developed by tissue culture and art, the, this kind of a construct uh, that may enable us to question the classification of the world according to human, animals, non-living and living entities. Uh, you know, furthermore, these kind of semi-livings, uh, such as uh, semi-living worry dolls, can fall into any of these categories and still not conform to any one of our understandings uh, of these categories. As a result, the uh, collective introduced an extended techno-scientific body that challenged us about the possibility of maintaining th certain categories or classifications that are being diluted by tissue engineering techniques. So, uh, very briefly, taking these kind of proposals into account with the regards to my current uh, my current research, which is uh, focused in bioresistant practices, uh, this dissolution involves uh, the commitment to interaction, I think, as well as the commitment to a non-hierarchical relationship between the different areas of knowledge. For instance, so biohacking proposals are developing, as you know, Oh, obviously, uh, open source tools from deconstructed and recycled materials such as the Ginepang that I know that some of you know pretty well too. It's a kind of a trans hack feminist collective. Uh, they are developing alternative bio labs in order to, to develop, uh, to, firstly to claim a kind of uh, gynecological knowledge not mediated uh, by the um, biomedical institution, I mean related to uh, hierarchical and hegemonical narrative. Uh, they work uh, on the decolonization of the body uh, from this kind of uh, narratives and uh, assembling a kind of an arsenal of open source tools for do-it-yourself diagnosis and first aid care but from do it with other practices. So uh, I'm going to finish. Uh, so the thing is that this project challenged us uh, to non-hierarchical organization to the possibility of fragmentation. These proposals uh, open the possibility of a conception of a body not ruled by biological hierarchy only, a body that is connected with the others and a body that we can articulate and re-articulate. So, um, but some of these projects is true that become spaces of interaction for potential micro narratives, and they set out uh, necessary. You can see this kind of uh, stuff developed by. There's a, a kind of joke, uh, natural censorship. You can see the whole picture because of the light. So this <laughs> pretty, pretty funny. So. Um, so these kind of projects, I think that they set out or they are setting out a necessary revision, revision of the taxonomies used in the classification systems related to our condition. And therefore, they open spaces to think on new forms of subjectivity. And some of them illustrate the embodied and embedded nomadic subject, uh, placing us in the estrangement because we can understand uh, I mean, we can't understand us anymore as we did some years ago. But the question that I want to, to share with you to finish my presentation is, um, I mean, are if 
we are prepared to think on subjectivity as a possibility of being extended with the others in the estrangement? Are we willing to accept being indifferent? Yesterday we saw that maybe we are not so, so different from Slimons, but different. Uh, so taking the notion of post-human uh, subjectivity, referring to a nomadic and relational subject from a monistic ontology, a soe-centered conception, a transversal subject entity fully immersed, as I said before, in an immanent to a network of non-human, yeah, okay, relationships. <laughs> Some questions on relation ethics uh, came up to my mind. So my question is, uh, if do you consider that a renewed agency could be an extended and distributed agency, a sort of Espinosian delation agency distributed by not, but not suspended, an agency that belongs to the amount of those others that compounds a non-unitarian post-anthropocentric subjectivity, or this is an aporia? So, because it seems to me, and I'm finishing yeah, right now, okay, uh, that some projects are confronting us to think the possibility of a distributed agency, an agency that doesn't delete the human being, but deletes the hierarchical conception of the human, proposing a sort of displacement from a pyramidal structure to a distribution agency as an extension. So a concept of agency that allows us to redefine a starting point, uh, to manage the possibility of a different co-being, a being indifferent, that help us to see the limits of ethics and to open the boundaries that we call uh, we could call a being extended with the others in the estrangement. So, and to conclude, a final specification, sorry, <laughs> that I want to share with you a kind of a collective reminder, connecting, I think, that to your question, is that don't forget that that theory can disrupt or disorganize boundaries, but at the same time, simultaneously, to be rigorous, theory formation also entails the materialization of boundaries. In the same way, the will to evolve to a post-anthropocentric perspective doesn't imply per se the non-instrumentalization of the others. So thank you very much. Okay.